Thanks a lot for the uh, introduction. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to break this talk down into basically four sections. Uh, if I understand correctly, this is a, a kind of broader physics department uh, audience than uh, just high energy physics seminars. So I'll spend a little bit of time introducing the problem as it were, uh, both in uh, terms of just the neutrinos themselves uh, and what the June experiment is. Uh, before then, yeah, talking about our event classification using the CNM uh, and then some uh, application of transfer learning in a June-like uh, detector. So starting at the beginning, um, we know that there are three types of neutrinos and they form some number of um, the, the, the particles of the standard model. Uh, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Um, so on the right hand side here, we have all of the particles that make up the universe and the kind of gauge bosons are the ones that are responsible for the, the forces. And uh, the three neutrinos are down here at the bottom and they are kind of partners to the, the charged uh, leptons, the, the lights of which is the, the electron we know and love. Um, so we have the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino. I'll probably call these uh, this is a Greek new, not a V, so I'll probably call these new E, new mu, and new tau at various points through the talk. Um, and yeah, they only feel the weak interaction. Um, so they don't have any electric charge and they don't have any color charge uh, like the quarks do. So um, I mean, as you can guess from the, the force being weak, they don't really interact very often. Uh, if you want to guarantee uh, that you'll have a neutrino interaction, then you need about a light year of lead. Um, so they're quite hard to find. Um, they're also predicted to be massless by this standard model, um, which I'll come back to a little uh, in a minute. So where do they come from? Uh, in short, everywhere. Um, we get them from the sun, the nuclear fusion process chain in the sun uh, produces uh, neutrinos at various points throughout the stage. Uh, get them from supernova. This is supernova 1987A, which is the only supernova that occurred um, during the, the time that we've had neutrino experiments. So uh, we're patiently waiting for another one. I think we're currently overdue one. So uh, hopefully we'll see one of those soon. Um, of course, we get them from radioactive decay, or strictly speaking, uh, mostly anti-neutrinos. You know, we get those from uh, nuclear reactors, natural sources, and like the, the Earth's core is also heated by radioactive decay. Um, we also get them from the Earth's atmosphere. So the sun ejects a lot of uh, stuff, including uh, protons, which can then interact in our atmosphere and produce um, kind of showers of other hadronic particles uh, or leptons as well, so muons and pions, and both of these types of particles decay to give neutrinos. Um, and most interestingly, at least in my opinion, uh, is the fact that we can actually make neutrino beams ourselves. Um, we basically take high energy protons and slam them into some sort of target, usually graphite, and then we also then make particles like these pions and muons, which we can then uh, focus magnetically and leave them to decay uh, in some sort of empty volume. And then when they decay, they produce the, the neutrinos that basically follow roughly the same trajectory of the beam. And after some absorbers and things, uh, we end up with our neutrino beam here at the end that uh, we can make use of. Um, we've known for a while now that neutrinos can oscillate uh, this got the Nobel Prize, I think, back in 2016 or so. Um, by this, I mean that they can change from one type to another as they travel. So we can start off with a muon neutrino here, which is typically uh, how our neutrino beams work. And then if you try and measure your neutrino beam at some point later, at some distance away, you might find that it's turned into an electron neutrino over here. Uh, this is a purely quantum mechanical process uh, that requires neutrinos to have mass. Um, so this is the first and currently only observation of physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. So when people tell you they're looking for uh, BSM physics, 
uh, in particle physics and say that none has been discovered yet, they all conveniently forget that neutrino oscillations are. Um, anyway, uh, we don't know how they get their mass. Um, all of the other particles get theirs through the Higgs mechanism, but um, it doesn't work for neutrinos. So, but that's a puzzle uh, for another day. Um, just to give a little formalism here, uh, the neutrinos we actually measure as they interact are the flavor states. Um, so these are the, the like electron, muon, and tau neutrino states that interact with the weak interaction. Um, but when they propagate through, through free space, they kind of do this as um, what we call mass states. Uh, and these are the, basically each of the flavor states is a superposition of the mass states. Um, and since there are three of each, then you get this U matrix um, that is called the, the PMS matrix, that um, where the individual elements of this matrix basically give you the uh, makeup of each of these uh, flavor states in terms of the mass states. Um, the mass states have different masses, which means that the kind of phase velocities of the prob probability distributions uh, are different. So going back to this picture, when we had our muon neutrino here on the left, it had some combination of these three mass states. And then at all points along the kind of distance it's traveled, uh, it has a superposition of these states. So then when you measure it here on the right, you collapse the wave function and you might find that you're then uh, an electron neutrino instead of a muon neutrino. Um, this matrix is typically parameterized uh, as follows. Um, it's kind of historically written as three matrices because the first and the last one were originally made considered to be, uh, well, it was possible that they were decoupled, um, but this central matrix actually uh, links everything, uh, everything together. So there are only four parameters that describe this. Three of them are what we call mixing angles, so these are theta one, two, theta one, three, and theta two, three. Uh, and then this central matrix has this um, exponent term containing a, a phase delta um, that we call the CP violating phase. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what this is uh, in a couple of slides time. And the, the frequency of the oscillations comes from uh, the kind of difference in the mass or explicitly the, the difference between the squares of the masses um, and if you plug the, the states one, two, and three into this equation, you can get yourself three mass splittings, uh, but only two of them are actually uh, independent. So that basically means we have six things to measure uh, in order to measure neutrino oscillations. Um, and at least in accelerator physics, we do that using a, a muon neutrino beam. So what we want to do is start off with a pure beam of muon neutrinos and then go some distance away and look again and see what we would uh, expect to find. So this plot on the right shows exactly that. Uh, when we're at the production point, so we're at zero on this L over E um, axis, just assume we're talking about one GeV, then this is just L. Um, then we have a, 100% chance at the top here that our muon neutrinos in blue, uh, are all, that the beam is fully muon neutrinos. If we go to about 500 on this axis, you see that most of our muon neutrinos have vanished. Um, and you can see from this equation here that the probability uh, for the, the muon neutrinos to survive is one minus this uh, oscillatory function here where this uh, mixing angle that I mentioned before, theta two, three, basically tells you how deep this uh, dip in the probability distribution is, uh, and phase is given by this uh, function uh, here. Um, and so once the mu neutrinos here have disappeared, then a lot of them have turned into tau neutrinos in the red, uh, and a few of them have turned into the electron neutrinos uh, in the black here. And these are the ones that are the most interesting for us because when you work through the mathematics, you get this first term that just is oh. kind of a second term that's similar to this one in that you have two phases, uh, two of these, sorry, mixing angle terms multiplied together uh, and the standard phase term, but you also get this extra term 
that depends on the, the CP violation uh, phase. And this term changes sign whether we're talking about neutrinos or antineutrinos, where I notate the antineutrinos here with a bar above the uh, new. So if we can measure that there's a difference uh, in this oscillation probability when we look at neutrinos and antineutrinos, uh, then we know that there is a CP violation. So uh, why exactly is this important? Well, our universe, as far as we can tell, is made from matter. But um, as far as we know, the Big Bang should have produced equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And given that we don't live in a universe that is effectively a diffuse uh, photon C, then uh, we have to ask, where did the antimatter go? So we refer to this kind of difference between matter and antimatter as CP violation. Uh, and just to say that this CP part um, kind of corresponds to two uh, operators where C is the one that we call charge, uh, which basically uh, swaps particles to antiparticles, and P is parity, which is a kind of reversal of spatial dimensions. So we would expect the this um, to be conserved if uh, matter and antimatter uh, behave in the same way. And since our antimatter is gone, then we're searching for places where we might have possible CP violation. And so this parameter delta um, naturally allows for this uh, in neutrino oscillations. So um, the, the aim of the kind of next generation of uh, neutrino oscillation experiments is to try and uh, see if the value of delta CP is non-zero. Um, just quickly, uh, a slide about the types of interactions as this will be useful later. Um, we only measure the uh, type of neutrino in charge current events. So that's these ones on the bottom left where we have the neutrino coming in, some interaction with the nucleus happens and makes some hadrons. But then we have this charged lepton uh, up here. So for example, if this is a muon neutrino here, we get a negatively charged muon coming out that we can identify um, the event with. Whereas for neutral current events, all of the neutrino flavors look the same in these interactions because we get the outgoing neutrino here instead, uh, which we can't detect. So we only have uh, this hadronic system uh, remaining for those sort of events. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the Dune experiment now. So Dune is the deep underground neutrino experiment, and it's based uh, out in the US. The neutrino beam will be produced at Fermilab, uh, which is near Chicago, and then the neutrinos travel uh, through the near detector, which is also at Fermilab, uh, before traveling 800 miles across a couple of states. Um, to the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota, where they will be detected by uh, four modules uh, underground, about a mile underground, um, with a total mass of about 70,000 tons of liquid argon. Um, and one of the main goals is, is to measure CP violation. So, the, the, the main facts about the neutrino beam is that it can run in neutrino mode uh, and runs in anti-neutrino mode as well. Um, so we basically just flip the polarity of these magnetic uh, focusing horns that I uh, mentioned before in order to achieve uh, those two different settings. Um, the detector technology uh, is liquid argon time projection chambers. So I think these are conceptually quite simple. Um, in this figure here, um, we have a cathode on this side, uh, an anode on the other side, and a fairly strong electric field of 500 volts per centimeter. Uh, and all of this is in a big liquid argon bath. So when some sort of charged particle comes through, like for example, a muon, it travels through, uh, liberates some electrons from the argon, which then drift in the electric field to the anode. Um, and then the anode is actually made up of three wire planes in this type of detector that we uh, call our horizontal drift. So the first two are induction planes. So the charges actually drift past the wires uh, and induce charges. And then the third plane is actually uh, where the electrons are collected themselves. Um, so this basically gives us three two-dimensional views of each uh, event. 
and where one of the views is the time uh, or the kind of drift direction uh, that's shared between all three of them. So we have a prototype at CERN called Protodune, and this plot here shows what this looks like in reality. So the wire readout plane here is on the left, uh, and the central cathode is on the right. Um, I say central cathode because there's another one of these readout planes on the other side, but uh, I can't show it all in one figure. Um, and this detector is about a thousand tons of argon, but it's only roughly one twentieth of the size that, that uh, June will be. Um, so you know, this picture is basically this small segment of this uh, much larger detector that we'll be building soon. So there'll be four modules in total. The first one will be this design. Um, the second one will use a vertical drift design, which is basically if you flip the detector by 90 degrees and you have your readout at the top and bottom, um, it'll have a simpler like printed circuit board readout. Um, it, designed to be uh, a bit more, well, cost effective, and it should also um, give us the opportunity to replace any electronics that uh, could go wrong over the long lifetime of the experiment. Um, the other two modules, um, the detector technology is currently undecided, um, but there'll be more time to, to design those um, as we go forward. And just to say that the cavern excavation at SURF has actually begun. So this is a mile underground. They managed to get some diggers and things down there. Uh, so the fire detector is uh, actually becoming a reality, uh, despite the fact that June's been spoken about for, for many years now. We're actually getting there and uh, making physical progress as well. Um, the near detector which I won't really talk about very much because uh, the, the work I'll show here is related to the fire detector. Um, but we have three different detectors. One is liquid argon, like the fire detector, then have a gaseous argon detector behind that and uh, a hybrid tracking detector uh, over here as well. The main job of the near detector is to just measure the neutrino flux. So this tells us what the exact makeup of the beam is. It should be mostly muon neutrinos, but there are some electron neutrinos uh, in the beam as well. Uh, we can also measure cross sections, um, basically to provide constraints uh, when we try and do the fits later uh, to measure the oscillation parameters um, to constrain uh, uncertainties that would otherwise be there. Okay, so moving on to the actual kind of uh, data science part. Um, for, the, for the main analysis we do, the, the CP violation analysis, we need to look at these charge current muon neutrino events. Um, and through these events, we measure two of our oscillation parameters, theta 2, 3, and delta n squared 3, 1. Uh, and then the electron neutrino appearance, we're looking at the charge current UE events. Um, and the constraints from the muon neutrino sample mean that um, we basically extract theta 1, 3, and delta CP from this uh, appearance channel. Uh, and we do the same for antineutrinos and fit all of those uh, samples together. So the main job that we need to do uh, here is to uh, classify events. So we need to make sure we can nicely identify these charge current muon neutrino events uh, and the charge current MUI events. So on this slide, um, talk about the muon neutrino disappearance. So the muon neutrino events are characterized by a long muon track. Um, and the main background to these events comes from uh, neutral current interactions that have a, a long uh, pion track in them uh, where the pion hasn't uh, interacted. So if you're trying to do this by eye or you want uh, a computer to do this, then the main thing you're looking at here is this long muon track uh, in, the, in the event on the left. Uh, and in the event on the right, you could probably imagine that you could easily get this event wrong by assuming this uh, track here is a muon as well. Considering the electron neutrino appearance, then the, the electrons in the, the signal events produce uh, what we call an electromagnetic shower in the detectors when they're at the energies we're looking at. So you basically get a short track before the electron um, 
it kind of interacts and makes this big spray of uh, charged particles. Um, and the main background here comes from neutral current interactions again, but this time with a neutral pion, not a charged pion. Um, these pi zeros decay to a pair of photons, uh, effectively instantly. Um, and then these photons go on to produce uh, their own electromagnetic showers. So again, if you want to try and identify these sorts of events by eye, uh, in the plot on the left, that's the signal event, then you see this uh, electromagnetic shower emanating from the vertex. Uh, and in this event on the right, you'd also be looking at this kind of showery part. Um, the giveaway here is there's this small part up here that is uh, from one of the photons. Uh, and the other photon is a much bigger shower here uh, and could easily be uh, confused with the electron here since this track nearly goes back to the vertex point. So that's the challenge we need to solve. Um, I just wanted to quickly give a, an example of a couple of uh, CNNs that were used previously in neutrino physics that preceded um, the work we've done. Uh, the first one was NOVA, uh, which is a current experiment at Fermilab, and uh, June is in some ways the successor to NOVA. Um, they used it for event classification uh, back in 2016, and they found that they got a 40% increase in their selection efficiency with no loss of purity for their main analysis. So this is exactly comparable to somebody giving them a 40% larger detector with which to do their experiment. So this was a bit of a, this made a lot of people stand up and take notice in the field. Um, in the, these, these sorts of deep learning approaches can really uh, help you get a lot more for your money. Um, then about the following year, Microboon published a paper. Uh, Microboon is also a liquid argon TPC uh, like June. And they were using a CNN to uh, find neutrino events within their kind of large uh, volume of cosmic ray events. Uh, and they did this sort of region finding technique where they uh, try to draw a box around the region with the neutrino event in and give some sort of probability for how likely it is to, to be a neutrino event. So uh, with the network we use for June, which uh, for some reason is called the CVN uh, instead of just a CNN, uh, we want to classify events as charged current muon neutrino, charged current electron neutrino, charged current tau neutrino, or neutral current. I'm not going to discuss the tau neutrinos very much here, um, mostly because they're very rare and hard to classify. Um, so I will sweep those under the rug for now, um, as by far the most important things are the, the muon neutrino and electron neutrino identification and the background coming from the neutral currents. So this work started towards the end of 2017. Um, so the architecture was based on the squeeze site ResNet 34, which was one of the kind of state of the art algorithms uh, at the time. Uh, there are a few changes we made uh, compared to the uh, standard version of this network. The first being that these first few uh, convolutional layers, we split them out into three individual branches so that each one of our three readout views would process separately um, just to allow for different low level feature extraction from the different views that um, could arise from the fact that they're different projections of the event. Um, then it passes through all of the, the standard uh, blocks that you would expect. And then we have a number of outputs at the end. This top one here is the flavor classifier, which is the, the, the most important one uh, for the analysis. Um, we also have a, couple, a few other outputs down here in this blue region. Um, these are ones where we're trying to count the number of uh, different types of hadrons in the final state that are kind of emitted by the interaction with the nucleus. Um, I will mention these briefly, um, but we have to uh, study these further. So we trained this on over 3 million events. Uh, it took about a week to train on a machine with eight V100s, though I'm not entirely sure how many of those uh, GPUs were being uh, used at the same time. Um, the 
plot here on the right or collection of plots uh, shows the, the loss and the accuracy uh, as a function of the number of epochs. The blue curves uh, show the accuracy where the solid line is the validation and the dashed line is the training. Uh, and the green curves, again, uh, the dashed one shows the validation for the loss, sorry, the training loss and the validation loss is shown in green. Uh, we stopped the training at 10 epochs um, because the validation uh, loss and accuracy didn't change after this point. Um, there's a small difference between the training and validation here, but the fact that it's smooth and doesn't uh, drop off a cliff at any point after this epoch uh, seems to show that it, it generalizes well anyway. So um, that's the point where we stopped our training. And the, the same story seems true through the different uh, outputs with the protons, charged pions, and neutral pions here. So if you then run all of our events through this network and do the inference, uh, you get distributions like this. Um, so these two plots on the left are showing the electron neutrino score um, for all the different types of events we have. So both in neutrino mode on the left here and uh, the, the right hand of these two plots uh, showing the anti-neutrinos. So the orange curve here is the signal that we're trying to measure. And uh, as you would hope, this is piling up nicely, a score of one. Um, you notice this red curve also peaks around one. Uh, these are actually electron neutrino events. They're just ones from the beam, not ones that have appeared during their 800 mile journey. So they are basically the same particle. So you'd expect them to pile up here. Uh, it's just an irreducible background. Um, but the three backgrounds, so from the muon neutrinos, tau neutrinos, and all neutral current events uh, are mostly piling up uh, at the low score values, uh, as you would hope. Um, and the same goes for the anti-neutrino case. Then on the right, we just have uh, the muon neutrino score. And again, as you would hope, the muon neutrinos in blue uh, have uh, higher score values, and the backgrounds uh, have the low values. Uh, I didn't include electron neutrinos in this plot because they're very rare, so they would just uh, expand the scale unnecessarily, uh, and they are in effect, they are effectively completely negligible uh, in these plots. Uh, and we can then apply a cut on these distributions to select the events that we want, and then that, help, that enables us to define our selection efficiency for uh, the events we're interested in. Um, the Plots on the left again show the selection efficiency for electron neutrinos, and we peak at about 90% for the neutrino mode and nearly up to 95% for anti neutrinos. Uh, this, it's slightly easier to identify anti neutrinos because the events are, are not as messy. Uh, the hadronic systems are generally smaller. Um, but uh, this looks like it works very well. Uh, and with the muon neutrinos, we're a little bit higher, as they're a bit easier to identify generally. Um, but in all of these cases, we exceed this dashed line uh, in the main region where our events are, which is uh, a kind of fast Monte Carlo that was done in the first conceptual design report for the experiment um, that made a lot of assumptions, uh, and people were worried uh, at some point that it was unrealistic, given that the previous approaches had not really got anywhere near this. So this approach has worked very well and demonstrated that we should be able to uh, reach and exceed this uh, initial performance goal that was um, put out uh, when the experiment was designed. Um, so we actually then just get four samples of events out of this. So we get about a thousand events um, from electron and anti-electron neutrino uh, samples uh, with pretty low backgrounds. Um, and again, for the uh, muon neutrinos, uh, we're talking of the order of uh, 10,000 events uh, for these. Um, for the actual analysis itself, I just want to quickly mention that um, we have to use the near detector in the analysis that's published in these official uh, June sensitivities. Uh, we only used um, a fairly small number of samples from the near detector that could probably be uh, a lot larger in the future, but this was um, what we conservatively used at the time. 
so this is just muon neutrino interactions um, as a function of both energy and inelasticity. Inelasticity is just the amount of energy that's transferred from the nu from the neutrino to the nucleus. Um, so I don't want to go into this plot too much. We basically do a joint fit of the far detector spectra and the near detector ones, um, and um, then use this to, to measure the values of the oscillation parameters and particularly uh, this CP violation parameter. Um, so we should have the sensitivity to make a five sigma discovery of CP violation in neutrino oscillations for over 50% of all of the true values for this uh, phase. And in the full lifetime of the experiment, we can hopefully get down to between seven and 16 degree resolution um, depending on the, the true value again. Um, okay, I, I said I would briefly mention the, the particle counting output. So we wanted to include these because there may be some advantages uh, in an analysis to consider final states exclusively. So, you know, simpler looking events typically have a better energy resolution and things like that. So you can uh, divide up your samples to take advantage of um, different types of events having different um, resolutions. So for example, uh, events with just a single proton in the, uh, in the uh, final state, uh, you can actually calculate the energy exactly just through like a two body scattering process. So to find those, you can just multiply your muon neutrino score by the one proton score and multiply then by zero in the other particle types. Uh, and you can get some sort of distribution that's a, a compound score. And as you would hope, the uh, signal piles up uh, in the uh, region around one uh, and your backgrounds again, uh, are where you would hope they would be down at zero. You can do a similar thing for the neutral current uh, events where you just want to have a single pi zero, which is the main background to the electron neutrino analysis. Uh, and again, things look uh, pretty good um, as you would hope in this plot on the right. These will need to be validated a lot more before we can use them on data. Um, they're a lot more likely to be biased by the choice of your simulation um, as the fine details of how many particles are produced uh, differs in the different simulations with different models of uh, the nucleus. Um, so that's something that will be looked at um, in the coming years. So now I'd like to move on to a kind of bit of a side project that I did uh, last year with a colleague, uh, Andy Chappell at Warwick. Um, and we wanted to see if we could make use of uh, kind of transfer learning to um, kind of reduce some of the burden that uh, you have in trying to do these deep learning approaches. So transfer learning lets you make use of a network that you've previously trained for some other task. Uh, and then you basically fine tune the weights as opposed to starting from scratch. And it can be useful if you don't have much data. Um, it's also not a new idea. Uh, it goes back to the early days of perceptrons. The first mention of it I found was this paper by Bozinovsky and Fulgosi um, back in uh, 1976. So the question, as I said, we wanted to know whether we can reduce the number of training examples. Uh, simulations are very time consuming. Those 3 million events I mentioned earlier probably took a few weeks to generate on a big computing grid. Um, and GPUs themselves take a lot of power to run and they're quite expensive uh, and they're also quite scarce at times. So um, if we can get the same performance with uh, fewer events, then I, I think everyone would agree that that would uh, be a good thing. Um, one convenient thing with our detector is that uh, we have three readout views. So if you choose to just stack those together and pretend it's a photograph, then you could make use of uh, a network that has been trained on just uh, normal photographs. So that's what we chose to do and what we wanted to test. Um, I did do a little research before this uh, just to see if transfer learning had been used much uh, in related fields. Um, the only real one I found was uh, a nuclear physics experiment called the ATTPC. Uh, the paper here uh, is, is linked down there. Um, it didn't inspire this study, but it was um, something that 
uh, I found interesting. Um, they had a very small simulation uh, and for one of their classes of events, the simulation was very poor. Uh, so they managed to make use of transfer learning to uh, recover the performance they would hope to see. Um, and also did this using uh, some hand labeled data to get around the problem of poor simulation quality. Okay, so for this study, we didn't use the full June experiment or, or anything like that. We just mocked up our own uh, simple version. So we generated some neutrino events from the Gini uh, neutrino event generator that I think a lot of people there at uh, Liverpool actually work on. Um, we made muon neutrino, electron neutrino, and neutral current events. Um, didn't bother with new towels uh, for this study um, and made 50,000 of each of these events and then passed this through a very simple uh, simulation of a generic liquid argon time projection chamber. Uh, where I got the, the outputs from the three different uh, wire planes. And then in this bottom picture, you can see we basically just stack them on top of each other uh, and end up with something that has red, green, and blue channels, but admittedly doesn't look much like a photograph. So the architecture we used for this study was um, the PyTorch implementation of ResNet 18. So we chose this fairly shallow network because over the course of this study, we'd need to train about a thousand networks. So this already took long enough using ResNet 18. Um, so anything more complex uh, would have been rather unfeasible. Uh, that said, the purpose of the study is to compare two things. So the ResNet 18 does work pretty well, um, but we weren't going for absolute performance. So even if a better, a bigger network could have got us, you know. 5% more accuracy or something like that, it wasn't really relevant to the study that we were doing. So this ResNet 18 had already been pre-trained on the ImageNet challenge sample. So the goal of the ImageNet challenge is to classify a photograph as one of a thousand classes, you know, various things like cars and cats. Um, so the I split the network into what I call the feature extractor, which is all of the convolutional layers in the, the ResNet. And then the final layer, which is just the dense layer I call here the classifier. Um, so this has a thousand nodes um, in terms of the um, ImageNet challenge. And for the event, and to modify this for what we want, all we do is chop off that classifier and stick a new dense layer in instead that has three classes uh, to correspond to the three classes we have I just say that the minimum thing you would have to do to then make this network useful is to uh, train this final layer. If you wanted to, you could leave the entire feature extractor alone and just train this final layer and, and see how it looked. So we train two types of networks. So as I said, we, we fine tune this pre-trained ResNet. And the other thing we did was to take a randomly initialized ResNet 18 uh, using the Kaiming or He uh, initialization scheme. And then for these two types of networks, we trained them on various numbers of events ranging from 1,000 up to 100,000 so that we could get a feeling of how things might change you know, with different numbers of uh, training events. Um, and each network was trained 25 times for each of these combinations, uh, obviously using different random seeds. Uh, this was to allow us to actually Kind of do this study systematically and assign uncertainties on the measured performance metrics and things. As a lot of studies you see just generally with deep learning, you know, they you have one training uh, and there's always some random variation uh, in the training process. So we wanted to be thorough and, and have these uncertainties uh, there. So this plot shows uh, the F1 score obtained um, from training the, uh, the transfer learn network from 1,000 up to 100,000 images. So yeah, the, the, the number of images are given on the x-axis. And we have here the F1 score for both the validation sample in red and the test sample in cyan. Uh, and as you'd hope, uh, within the uncertainties here, uh, these two uh, agree nicely. Uh, and then the interesting part is that is these gray bands. 
So this top gray band shows the F1 score you get from using the randomly initialized network uh, with all 100,000 training images. Um, and you can see that in the, the case where we're using the transfer learned network, uh, when we get to about 7,000, 10,000 events, then we've uh, already exceeded the performance of the, the randomly initialized network. Um, and I also mentioned that uh, the minimum thing you have to do is train the last, uh, the new kind of classifier dense layer. Um, so if you do that and leave everything else alone, you get this bottom bar here, which with an F score of 0.79, I think works remarkably well, given that all you've done is rearrange the information that comes out of the uh, photographic recognition network. So, okay, this plot is kind of averaged over everything. So we wanted to make sure that we were actually seeing improvements in the individual classes that we're trying to classify and not just you know, improving one to the detriment of others. Uh, here I'm showing the accuracy for the, the different classes. This plot is a, a bit of a mess, admittedly, but it was requested by the reviewers of the paper. So um, in each of these cases, you basically want to try and compare the CC new mu from the transfer learning, for example, with the CC new mu from the Kaiming. So that's black with gray or the, the red with the magenta or the uh, cyan with the orange. Um, to stop you getting headaches looking at the plot, uh, I can say that we see improvements in all in all three of the different uh, classes that we're trying to classify here. So um, we see improvements uh, across the board. We were then also concerned about uh, potential biases, for example. So we did a study um, to see how uh, how the classification looked um, both between different classes uh, and as a function of the neutrino energy. So I didn't say earlier that our neutrinos were within the range one to four GeV. And this plot on the left shows the, the Kaiming initialized network that was trained from scratch. You can see there's some variation as a function of energy uh, and quite a lot of variation between the accuracy for the dip three types of uh, interactions. Um, and in the transfer learning case, we kind of compressed this um, both in terms of the performance between the classes and um, the, the effect of the energy. But that's not to say that there isn't some expected energy. Um, there should be some effect as a function of energy just from the underlying physics in that it's harder to measure things with small energies than it is with large energies typically. So, the last thing I want to show you is um, a study of the, during the transfer learning where we were looking at just freezing different parts of this uh, initial network. So by this, I mean restricting the, the number of weights that we are fine tuning in the transfer learning case. So I already told you uh, about the classifier only part, which is the minimum we have to do. And this corresponds to the 0 0.79 I mentioned before. This time it's accuracy, but it turns out the accuracy and F1 scores uh, were basically the same here. Um, so then if we go back quickly to look at the, um, the architecture I showed here, the in the literature, um, the ResNet, authors group these convolutional layers together into what they convenient, well, not very conveniently call these layers. So there are layers one to four and what I've called layer zero here, which is just the first convolutional layer. So kind of working from the back, well, sorry, working from these end layers upwards, I gent gradually uh, increased the number of weights that we uh, allowed to be uh, trained. So when we trained the classifier and fine tuned layer four, you get a big jump uh, in the accuracy. This is mostly because most of the network weights are in this uh, layer four. And then you see smaller increases as you then allow more weights to be fine tuned in layers uh, three and then also including layer two. Um, I think the interesting part of this plot is shown on the right where the, the performance is basically the same once you've included layer one uh, and then included the first convolutional layer uh, as well. So I think the 
the take home message from the, this part of the study is that um, basically the, the first convolutional layer is the one that does the real low level extraction of just uh, straight well, edge finding on just uh, a few square pixels uh, and sort of gradient finding and, and the real low level things. And that doing this on photographic images uh, finds all of the low level things that you would find probably in any sort of image. So um, even though our images don't look anything like photographs, uh, the first layer does extract everything we need to then classify our events as we go lower through the network. And as you go deeper into the network, obviously this is the point where the network starts seeing larger and larger patches of the, the input image. So in those cases, it becomes more important that you can retrain, sorry, you can fine tune these weights because these are the things where your events start looking more like your, uh, it's starting to look more like uh, full images as opposed to just very small patches. Um, so that brings me to my conclusions. Um, I showed an example of uh, image recognition use for event classification with June. Um, there are many other examples uh, of deep learning. Uh, there's a nice talk here from uh, Kazu, uh, who's one of the, the leaders of deep learning in uh, neutrino physics uh, on end-to-end -end reconstruction for the near detector. Um, we also have a publication from the Protogen uh, kind of prototype detector, where we used a small CNN to do hit classification, a kind of simple alternative to a semantic segmentation approach. Uh, and there are various other things being uh, introduced all the time now. Um, and I hope I also showed that transfer learning looks like it could be very promising to help reduce um, computational burdens. Um, and we found that we couldn't find any biases in the, the process and it seemed a bit more stable. Um, and yeah, I think that's uh, all I have to say. So thanks very much for your attention, everyone. And um, more than happy to answer any questions. Cool, thanks very much. So uh, any questions in the room, any questions online, just put your hand up and I'll come across and I'll either um, read out questions you've put in the chat. So if your hand's up, then I'll just um, call on you directly. So any questions in the room first? Um, I don't know if you all have looked at it all, but you're saying that using transfer learning, you get better results for when you're uh, considering data sets where there's small amounts of pending data. Uh, do you know if uh, using, so obviously your network that you are retraining on some other data set, does it matter what that data set is and does it help in any way if that data set is of a similar sort of type or context of data? So I wasn't able to test exactly that hypothesis. I would, I would say that we've probably shown here that it can help with probably something that looks the most different than you could expect to your input uh, events in the case that you're still looking at a two-dimensional image. Um, I think yeah, doing this with something that's trained on something much closer to your uh, your expected uh, input images, then you would probably get uh, a, a better result uh, with fewer images, I think. Um, when it comes to kind of before June actually starts, we will retrain the CVN that I was talking about previously. Um, and it seems like a good idea to not just train another network on 3 million events that takes us months to produce, but maybe we can use a kind of an updated version of the simulation and the reconstruction, for example, and make a smaller sample of events and just fine tune uh, the, the current training because it's not something you expect to change drastically. So maybe you can kind of be cleverer and just start with something that you know is representative and then you can then just fine tune that from there and avoid reinventing the wheel and starting from scratch. So Chris72 in the audience has raised their hand. If you want to shout out. Hi, can you hear me, right? Uh, yep. 
Nice. Oh, thanks for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, question then. So um, if I've understood rightly, you said that um, it looks like after layer one, um, it looks like you've kind of picked out all of the main features that you would need for this data set. Yeah, so I mean, what I mean here, yeah, that the the fact that once you've if you allow the whites in the very first convolutional layer to uh, be fine tuned as well, uh, then you don't see any improvement to what you get from having all of the whites fine tuned like up to that layer. So yeah, so what I'm saying there is that that definitely seems to imply that the very first layer can extract all the information that you need uh, to feed the later layers. Uh, that will then allow you to, to do your classification. Right, okay. So do you think that there might be any value in cropping, say, literally after the first layer and putting the classifier at that point once you've got those low-level features extracted? The, the main part of the, the power comes in the later layers where it is, as you go from kind of, right to left in this plot your like in layer four your network is basically looking at the entire image um more than it was just looking at a, i think it's seven by seven pixels basically in in the first couple of layers so um you need to have all of the layers there but you can make choices about which uh which of the parameters you would fine tune um for example it, you could save some computational burden by not training any of the weights from layers two, one, or the first one, for example, and then you would still be doing pretty well with an 88% accuracy. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Thank you. So I've got like a pretty general question. What's the, the time scale for the Dune experiment? When are you expecting it to be operational? Uh, it, should be up and running in the early part of the next decade. So hopefully around like 20, 2030, 2032. Um, it's one of those things that <laughs> has moved backwards uh, from the start, but then it did move forwards a little bit at some point. So um, yeah, I mean, it, the funding I think now is approved nicely in the US and as you saw work has actually begun so that's always reassuring that it is actually uh, on track and getting started uh, but in terms of how long the experiment will run it will run for probably 15 or 20 years it's a it's a long scale project um, yeah so um, even though I mean this the, and in terms of software development obviously that's something that's going to be continuously developed through the years so um who knows what techniques might come out of the woodwork in that time so uh, it's sort of thing where we have to be also have to be adaptable on that front and you know keep trying to take advantage of new techniques that come out um, i mean transformers are taking over the world so that's probably something to play with soon as well so do you think that the um the dune experiment will be like the main focus of your academic career you know, you're talking about these like long time scales. Can you see yourself you know, in the 2030s being uh, kind of tenured somewhere working on Dune and then it takes up your research from that point? Yeah, I, I, I think that Dune, neutrino physics will probably, well, at least in terms of long baseline experiments that can measure CP violation, there will be Dune and Hyper-K and that's it. So if you want to do long baseline physics, you, you have two choices uh, and you would be forced to work on one or the other. I don't think you'd be allowed to work on both uh, as you know, people would say, maybe they're competitors. Um, it's a bit terrifying when you think about these experiments that have long timescales uh, in terms of thinking of your career span in terms of number of experiments. And as you say, that might well be one from now. I always quite like the um, missions like Cassini where you'd have a lot of people employed for you know, the development of the, the probe. Then it would go up and it would kind of mothball for you know, about a decade. And then you have to rapidly rehire people again when it actually gets to, to Saturn in the end. So at least you don't have that problem. Yeah, it should be, uh, there'll always be something to do. Yeah, well, are there any 
other applications of your um, event classifiers. So, for, for instance, could you use it on something like the Ice Cube experiment for um, neutrino based astronomy? So, Ice Cube actually use a graph neural network approach as opposed to a CNN. Uh, it's because they have a, the, the structure of their detectors is much more geometric than it is suitable. Well, you can morph anything into look like an image, but they found a graph neural network does a much better job for them. Um, there was a paper from a few years ago that's uh, nice and describes this. I think they did it in conjunction with a, a group uh, who developed different types of graph neural networks. I can't remember, but I, I think it, it was done in conjunction with some computer scientists. So uh, it's a nice paper if you can find it. Okay. Uh, do you have any other questions online or in the room? No. So the, 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 the transfer learning um, approach, is this being picked up in different fields as well? Are you, are you aware of it's being used elsewhere? I, nobody's directly contacted me, but I, I mean, I, I've spoken about it a few different times and people always seem interested in it and think that it definitely seems like a good idea. So I, I'm hoping people will start picking up this approach. Um, even in terms of things like minimizing your carbon footprint, uh, which is gonna become more and more of an issue, I think, uh, both for universities and uh, other research agencies. Um, it can also, it helps you there, as I said, GPU farms take a lot of power to run. So um, it makes sense in a number of ways, I think. And I would be really pleased if people start, start doing this because it, it seems a bit more like using your brain than just starting again uh, for every task. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it feels like there should be some commercial applications for this. And maybe you have people who have sort of base trained neural networks and they license out their um, you know, the specific ways they're using and the clients can use that as a basis for their own application. Yeah, in a way, it's not too dissimilar from federated learning uh, things where you would, for example, in medical imaging, where you have to worry a lot about patient data security and things where you can just send a network to a given hospital they train the network on their data and then the network comes back and you then send it to another hospital who fine-tune it um, so yeah it, it, it's obviously related to, to various different things in that way as well I see. Okay. great well for some more questions um and I guess we'll wrap up there. Uh, thanks again. Thanks a lot.